So it is our pleasure to welcome Eli Sanders and uh, Leanne Baker today. And I am going to stop sharing my screen and invite you to share your screen and talk to us about the impact of long COVID on students um, that we are seeing. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Let me just quickly share my screen. So Eli, we know you as the Medicaid guy, and now you have just a little bit different role, but um, you can, do you want to tell us a little bit about what it is that your focus is now? And Leanne, yeah. you too. Um, I chuckle because I, I don't know if I want my legacy to be the Medicaid guy. So maybe it'll shift over with my career. Um, no, I, we had, a, a, so Eli Sanders, I'm the school health specialist at the Oregon Department of Education. And Deborah's correct. I was the Medicaid guy. I still kind of am um, as we're filling my old role. Um, I've, I've transitioned to um, the school health specialist position, which is a new position um, as of uh, last, sorry, my dog's barking. Um, uh, I had everything set and then it falls apart. Um, but uh, as of last uh, early winter, um, we I, I transitioned to this position um, based on legislation that separated out um, the old position of school health specialist that was coupled with um, comprehensive sex ed, uh, which I had that role prior. Anyway, long discussion, but the exciting part is, is that not, there's now a dedicated position that works uh, specifically with school health services and our licensed providers in our school settings. So. I can I get to focus in on um, on you all. So uh, yeah, that's who I am. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us, Leanne. Uh, sure. Hi everyone. My name is Leanne Baker. I am the school strategist for the ODE uh, Ready School Safe Learners team. Um, I've been with ODE for about a year and have primarily focused on helping schools operationalize COVID and communicable disease. Um, so thanks for having us today as we share um, how schools can support students with pediatric long COVID. I have the first part of this uh, presentation, so I'll, I'll jump in and rely on Eli to um, flag me if there's questions or something comes up in the chat. Um, the first thing we wanna share is that um, much, as, much of the information we're going to share with you today comes from a team of doctors at OHSU. Um, this past summer, we teamed up with OHSU uh, to develop a presentation um, and train teams in ODE and OHA on pediatric long COVID. So Dr. Vaz, Dr. Case, Dr. Hall, and Margaret Wolf collaborated with us to develop this information for you all. Um, and, and to share what they're seeing in their pediatric long COVID clinic. Uh, so Eli and I will do our best to answer your questions uh, today and share what it is we learned at that training and, um, and this knowledge, but just uh, be aware that our learning is still, is still continuing and um, we'll, we can certainly take back questions to the OHSU team as well. I would, I would also add and want to recognize that that you are all the licensed medical staff in the room uh, today, so not Leanne and I. Um, and so I, 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 I've done my best to try and pronounce the the medical terminology and um, uh, and and you know please you know view this as coming from the you know, some of the education lens. Uh, we talk about IDEA and and uh, 504 and accommodations, but um, really invite uh, uh, any any correction or um, your expertise in the room today. Absolutely. So our learning outcomes for today involve being able to name the features of pediatric long COVID that will impact a student's experience in school, to understand the scope of medical supports that a student might receive, explore those same supports as they translate into a school setting, and name additional supports that might be needed for a student to be a full citizen of their school and access their education. So first I'll just give a broad overview of pediatric long COVID. Um, this affects children who are generally asymptomatic 
uh, when they contract COVID or have very mild symptoms of COVID, of course, with a very low rate of hospitalization um, in children. Long COVID is still, there's still no precise or agreed upon definition worldwide. It's essentially signs and symptoms that persist, develop and fluctuate after a child is infected with COVID-19. The NICE Institute out of the United Kingdom and the NIH have variable definitions about the timing of when someone can be diagnosed with long COVID. And here in the US and at OHSU, they're relying on the NIH uh, definition, which is uh, symptoms that are sustained and continue for more than four weeks after initial COVID-19 infection. There's still, of course, a lot to be learned about long COVID, especially in children. Um, the prevalence of long COVID in children has been really difficult to understand and data to capture because of the population of early studies in this area have mainly been around adults. Uh, we now think that based on time and experience of OHSU's clinic, uh, it's less than 10% of children who have long COVID will develop long COVID, sorry, who have COVID will develop long COVID. The risk factors include adolescent age, um, age 13 to 17, and, female, and potentially female sex. It's extremely rare for a young child to have to develop long COVID. And in fact, in the OHSU clinic, the youngest child treated was eight years old at diagnosis. Um, so again, very, very rare. We think that um, vaccination may, may reduce the likelihood of developing long COVID, although it's of course still being studied. We know that children with long COVID previously were often previously were very healthy and that long COVID symptoms really represent a stark departure from their typical behavior. And this is very scary and stressful, of course, for both the child and the family. Um, there is a lot of overlap of pediatric long COVID with adult long COVID, um, but the management and rehabilitation uh, does have unique considerations in the pediatric long COVID. Uh, children will get better over time with careful management of their symptoms. Um, uh, yeah. This slide represents just the diversity of symptoms and various organ systems that can be involved with a children with a child with long COVID. Um, we'll be utilizing this slide later on but it also serves as a way of demonstrating um, just the diversity that a child can present with. The OHSU team has bolded the symptoms that they most commonly see in their clinic. Um, I'll, share, I'll share the handout um, with you all so that you can have this in the chat. In general, accommodations for, for a school um, or in a school may be related to a particular symptom that a child is experiencing. Um, so common symptoms uh, related to body or fatigue, brain fog. Um, for example, a, a student who has a symptom of headache will possibly carry a water bottle. Abdominal pain might require additional bathroom breaks. Um, and what we know is that some of these symptoms can wax and wane, come and go. When one symptom um, is cleared up, another one all of a sudden appears. Um, we'll cover these symptoms more in depth and, and offer some recommendations from the OHSU team, uh, which was shared with us. And again, children generally do uh, have a road to recovery with the right care in place. And this slide just really acknowledges that a lot of our kiddos um, have had effects from the pandemic, um, but long COVID is a bit different. So it's an abrupt change from a child's just typical behavior or their baseline. It often uh, is pre 
presents after an illness, um, that after an associated illness, excuse me, although COVID can be mild in children, so it could potentially be missed um, that a child has had long COVID. It is important, of course, that long COVID be diagnosed by a primary care provider or a pediatric specialist. Uh, these individuals uh, will really um, go in depth with the cofactors that can be happening uh, in children with long COVID, whether that be existing or prior diagnoses to see if those have gotten worse or if there are new issues that need to be uncovered, um, such as an issue re related to an auto autoimmune issue. Um, and of course, um, with long COVID, there is often mental health issues of just coping with a disease for a long period of time um, that affects both the child and, of course, the family. And from there, I'm going to turn it over to Eli. Great. Um, so in a school setting, Sorry, I'm looking because my my son is supposed to be walking out the door uh, to school and he's entering my office here. So quick. Um, can you drop off the uh, snack last week? Yeah. Well, did your mom drop me off? She just dropped it off here, but I need you to take okay. it. Okay. Right. I can't. How are you doing? I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm on a meeting. I can't. I'll, I'll be done at 9.20. So you should take it with you. I am so sorry. It's the, the privilege of working at home um, uh, and having a 10 year old who needs a good, anyway. Um, so uh, go, refocusing myself, um, there's a lot of health supports in school setting um, that that would interact with a student or, or provide supports or could should provide supports to schools uh, or to that student um, as they are trying to navigate getting back into school. Um, I think that the the uh, first ones are pretty obvious: school nurse, physical therapist, occupational therapist, um, making sure that the mental health supports uh, the uh, staff are there, um, and then we get into potentially. Um, some of the um, areas of IDEA or Section 504 with um, specially designed instruction um, and or accommodations with the 504. Um, this, uh, and I think uh, is, a, is a key spot for our licensed providers um, is the interaction with the community health partners. So um, yeah, certainly, uh, or we hope a, a student who's experiencing long COVID is having access to their primary care and specialty care providers in their community. Um, and those include, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, certainly mental health, um, and in some cases, um, some of the more uh, some of the specialists, cardiology, gastrologist, nutrition, uh, and so on. Section. Um, I'm not going to cover um, this. We're not going to go super in depth with IDA in Section Four. Um, those are often trainings in themselves. But I want. We did want to make sure that um, we highlighted the guidance, which is linked on this slide. Um, as co as students present with long COVID or symptoms of long COVID, um, the primary message from the U.S. Department of Education is that um, they should. That's the scenario should be. Um, that scenario should be treated simply uh, or as any other change in that student's behavior or condition. Um, and so if they already have a IDEA, um, any uh, changes to supports or, or needs related to PT, OT, or other services would be um, determined by that IEP team, hopefully, um, and expected to, to include assessment or input from the licensed providers. Um, as they're the ones that are, are best qualified to, to really evaluate um, the impact of a health condition as it relates to the student's learning. Um, so a, ch a child or student experienced long COVID um, may trigger a, a potential need for a new IEP um, that would follow through uh, the student, the uh, district's child find um, or identification process for IDEA. Um, I think more commonly, it may trigger a, a need for a, a review or of eligibility for Section 504. 
um, if that student is already are, are not, is not already on an IEP, um, because most of the most of these um, interventions would likely fall under accommodations. Um, and then the last bullet is that some some of the um, um, yeah. Yeah, so triggering more services and in some, I think, limited cases would trigger new a new eligibility under IDEA. Next slide. So some of the, um, uh, what it was shared with us from the physical therapy side, um, you know, they, they uh, really highlighted that there's uh, fatigue is, is being presented in, in different ways and different um, uh, extremes. Uh, one at chronic fatigue, where the, the student is uh, is generally um, experiencing fatigue um, that is profound, um, is not relieved by stress or by rest, um, and physical and mental activity make it worse. Uh, one of the things as I continue through, um, there's a lot of similar similarities with um, COVID, uh, long COVID and uh, a concussion or brain injury. Um, as it relates to the symptoms, Leanne uh, already mentioned the kind of come waning and waxing um, of symptoms, but also uh, what we're seeing as far as uh, as fatigue, as cognitive uh, challenges, um, and other things that are happening um, uh, with long COVID. And post exertional malaise um, is, is is being seen in students, where um, they have a, a significant activity during the day. Um, you know, a sports game or or practice or or you know, hang out with friends, and then the next day they're or, or soon after they're then experiencing a, a, a pretty high level of fatigue. Um, what has been reported in clinics is they're seeing the oxygen levels are dropping uh, with activity, heart rates uh, increase with activity. Uh, for example, climbing stairs, dizziness with activity, um, and headaches uh, seem to be a very common symptom. Next slide. So some of the recommendation, recommendation, recommendations from your PT colleagues at OHSU. Um, pacing, so planning, uh, balancing times of activity with periods of rest, um, schedule a break or less me uh, mentally taxing classes between harder classes. Um, I hesitate because uh, these folks are coming from the, the hospital clinical setting. So um, not understand the challenge of maybe changing classes around for a student, um, but the idea of, of, of balancing um, activity, the slow down overall, so increasing uh, passing time, um, potentially uh, slowing down uh, activity, uh, other activities uh, as as uh, throughout the day, prioritizing uh, to uh, doing what is important. Uh, one of the things that uh, they identified. Uh, in this section was that prioritizing what is important is should be focused on what is also important for the student. So there's the importance of completing assignments and, and learning, but also balancing that with social need, um, rest, interest, um, and really uh, because those, those things impact uh, their mental health in, in big ways. Um, some other accommodations, you know, uh, looking at uh, potential elevator use, passing maybe between, uh, not during passing time when the halls are packed, um, and potentially even distance learning or virtual classes. Body awareness. Um, on the virtual classes, Eli. Yes. Um, what you say about, you know, the lack of oxygen and is often showing up as, as similar to TBI. Um, we, uh, Melissa McCart, who works with uh, Seabert and TBI, she started saying the, uh, noticing that very early on and talking to us about that. And one of the primary, um, one thing that came out of COVID is that there needs to be a reduction of screen time and uh, for, for kids uh, that way. So whenever you talk about virtual classes, uh, that could be a help if they are, are lacking stamina, um, but the constant screen time has also been something that um, it really needs to be monitored. And I could share uh, some of Melissa's data, but going to the Seabird site would help you to uh, see some more recommendations for uh, supporting kids um, with TBI. So just wanted to throw that out there. No, absolutely. It's a, it's a 
balancing uh, yeah and i don't know if the, uh, i i i relate this and my my oldest son he's 21 now um and fortunately recovered uh, uh but he had a severe concussion in middle school uh he fell down on a on a lunch table um and uh and had symptoms for quite a while and and as a parent walking through this um that, that's kind of where i relate there's there's this balancing effort of trying to keep the student engaged um, and active, but also healing and and um, and taking the rest and the time and the and reducing that visual stimulation. Um, and they talked about that um, that visual stimulation or any stimulation can exa exaggerate the symptoms that they're feeling um, and and potentially delay healing. Um, and so balancing how you're providing the medium of what you're providing instruction i think is really important and so virtual versus versus written work being sent home versus um and those i think that's where it really comes into play everyone's expertise here as far as individually what that child needs at the moment um and and how that you know and and how best to support the family and the student um i absolutely agree the the screen time I fight it with with that guy, that kid who just who just went to school, um, uh, you know. But in in, a, in all seriousness, um, I agree. Um, these are, I think, and going back, you know, IDEA five hundred four, very focused on the individual needs of the student, not a general policy on you know. So maybe opposed to what we saw virtual learning happen during COVID um, as kind of general population, we're moving everybody or big probably big segments of our student body to virtual. Um, we need to look at the needs of the students who are um, who are uh, involved most. Um, I hope, I mean, yes, I'm trying to balance that. Um, pain management, so the pain uh, as it relates to um, long COVID is, is uh, primarily um, with headaches um, and, and uh, related to um, maybe some of the ongoing symptoms of uh, of the impact on the brain. Um, they also reported uh, muscle and bone aches, um, you know, some general body aches, and so general pain management strategies need to be considered. Um, and then uh, the progression uh, of treatment um, or intervention uh, is, it, they, um, they warn, can be very slow as the student progresses. It's not, you know, we're not seeing overnight change, but um, slow progression as, as students are receiving therapy. OT, um, you'll see some similar things uh, as far as it relates to um, occupational therapy. Um, Impact on daily activities. And, you know, so they're seeing uh, challenges with the, our, our students who are experiencing long COVID with self care activities. Um, examples uh, that they provided uh, during this time uh, during this session was um, you know a varsity athlete having a hard time completing daily living activities. Um, so showering, uh, remembering to brush teeth, um, uh, certainly having a challenge completing normal chores, um, participation in leisure play. So not having energy to to participate maybe in swim practice where, where in the past they were excited to or at least um, engaged in um, school engagement and certainly uh, difficulty completing homework attending to class or remembering what was just said so uh, conversation around directions um, and providing instruction in a way that's um, that student that students can can process um, Social participation, so hang out with friends um, or difficulty traffic track, uh, tracking conversations in a group settings. Um, and uh, using calendars or tools to stay organized. So just the organizational cognitive functioning um, is, is, is challenged. Thanks. Some of the recommendations. Again, these, uh, and, and I think uh, we're gonna go through a little breakout or a little activity. These are, um, you know, prepared by non 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 school based clinicians, and so um, I think it's important to 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 give give that grace, but also um, hopefully we can expand on some of these. Um, you know, school homework 
listening to textbooks, sign reading is possible. So we're looking at text to speech and other accessibility uh, tools where um, that may be uh, relied upon. Um, some read out loud or read to self exercises, teach backs, um, pacing, taking breaks, um, monitoring um, length of homework or complexity of homework. Um, looking at you know, staff, parent, and peer homework support. I would also add um, support in general, just as it relates to impact of symptoms that may be present one day and not the next. You know, again, similar to concussions or similar, uh, or, or not even day to day, but hour to hour, where 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 symptoms you know change. Um, you know, helping parents uh, create daily schedules and routines that students can can manage. Um, so maybe reduction of activities or thing um, happenings during the day, um, <clears throat> bringing it back down to basics and and then building back up. Um, we'll talk about brain fog, um, caught some of the cognitive stuff uh, later in the presentation. Um, but here, uh, occupational supports for that, therapy supports for that, um, reduce uh, workload, extra time, um, distractions, uh, uh, you know, private room, qu quiet corner in the classroom, <laughs> I guess, uh, at when possible, but um, really identifying space in the school setting that may offer less distraction, allow assistive technology if, if needed or determined to be needed. Um, there's the concise and clear directions and instructions for assignments, breakouts, um, like similar again, uh, concussions, you know, monitoring light uh, or other sensitivities that may uh, contribute to uh, a worsening of headaches. Um, the creation of or create shortened school day. Um, this is uh, a very, uh, it's a hot topic item uh, last week's COSA conference, but um, you know, that, that decision or process of looking at reducing the time the student has in school um, really needs to happen within the IEP team meeting. Um, so headache, headache management, um, we, I think folks are probably pretty aware of our medication administration guidelines and rules, um, but working with the doctor um, within uh, and making sure the primary uh, the orders are in place and and the information is present for medications related to managing headaches, um, hydration they they hit upon multiple times um, as a primary uh, thing to, to to ensure that students have access to um, routine uh, uh, insomnia and other sleeping uh, challenges uh, are uh, occur with long COVID and so making sure that sleep is, is happening, uh, our families are supported around uh, uh, adequate sleep, as well as eating. And there's your limiting screen time, um, Deborah. So um, making sure that that screen time is kept in check um, and then uh, self-care around meditation, deep breathing. Um, so stress uh, management and pain management. I think a lot of these, Eli, are things that we should all be doing. Uh, right. uh, when we talk about mental health, I think all of us have been taxed the last couple of years and really need Absolutely. to remind ourselves, remind ourselves for self-care too. So uh, a lot of these things I'm internalizing. Well, and, and as I heard this presentation for the first time, um, you know, the, I think it's, I hope it's pretty normal um, to kind of reflect on my experience during the pandemic. And, you know, and and though I've been vaccinated and boosted, I've had COVID twice now. Um, and kind of starting going, oh, that, um, what was there, is there a, 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 an effect that I maybe had just, I just worked through or lived through. And, um, you know, in this situation, we're talking about, you know, where it's, where students are really, um, you know, highly impacted. But, um, you know, I think to Deborah's point, there's, we've all been impacted by COVID, um, whether it's just our children or not just our children, but our children or family members or friends, um, you know, in, in many different ways. And so, yes, I absolutely agree. So with with a lot of that information um, that we, with the information that we present, which there was a, there's a lot of information, um, we'd ask that folks, um, and I don't know our breakout room, um, capacity during this presentation, but uh, we'd like to take a moment. Uh, we have a link, I believe, in the chat to um, our work, a worksheet that, uh, to both the worksheet as well as the handout that has uh, kind of some of the general symptoms of COVID. 
And we'd like to take a second to, to pick your uh, brains um, and your expertise as far as what, what some of the um, accommodations that we talked about may be implemented as it relates to each symptom, as well as potentially other accommodations that we didn't mention, um, that from your experience working with school, with students and families and teachers and schools, um, what, what may be important to implement or to think about um, as you're seeing a student come in with some of these um, symptoms. Um, and so do we wanna share, so what we've done in past virtual presentations is, is utilize a Google Doc um, so we can, so everyone can kind of work on it at the same time. Um, so folks can go to that Google Doc. Let me pull up my chat. So that that will that's right now in the chat under worksheet. If folks could pull up um, the worksheet, and maybe we could just spend five minutes where folks can look at the symptoms. Um, pick a symptom and maybe think about what a potential accommodation um, could be or um, health modification uh, would be and add that to the worksheet. Um, we can come back together in again about five minutes and kind of talk about what was hard or what was easy. Eli, does that sound okay to you? Do you want, are you saying you'd like us to go to breakout rooms or just take a few moments ourselves? If, if, um, if we can all, I think we all collectively work on the Google sheet. So we don't need to do breakout rooms. But okay. If, if folks can click on that link um, and I see people already filling it in. Um, so hurry up so you don't know there's okay. plenty. Of so how about I go ahead and share my screen with it on, uh, with the document up? Sure. Don't you just love the names that are assigned to anonymous chinchilla? Uh, my ten-year-old and I are doing a COVID study where they're they're we're doing weekly swabs and they, we get to pick an animal, uh, and he picked um, slug for me, slug. And, and hawk for him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anonymous slug on here, but that would be me. <laughs> Has that made you do some inner reflection there, Eli? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you the slug? <laughs> Great comments coming in. Yes.
Great job, folks. Maybe just one more minute if there's any other other thoughts. Or take a minute to review what others, what symptoms others have chosen and what they've written. I wonder how many of you are actually working with somebody who has been uh, diagnosed with long COVID. Probably more than we really know. Our OHSU team certainly uh, talked to us about and shared with us the difficulty of, of receiving a diagnosis at this time of um, how little is known about it and um, that just the barriers to even get to the OHSU clinic uh, is substantial and how they, um, they do feel like there are many, many children dealing with the after effects of COVID um, in profound ways that are not able to, to have the care or receive the diagnosis um, that, that would put them in this group <laughs> to make sure that they have the accommodations. Look how long it took for TBI to be put in that thing. And it's still having the diagnosis. I know credible history and all of those pieces have to come into play because it is so new and so abstract maybe. Absolutely. We did want to just open it up um, for a, a bit of discussion to see if, um, if there were any symptoms possibly that folks really shied away from because they, they could use some, um, some ideas from other colleagues about what a potential accommodation might look like um, uh, or Possibly they know that that would be very, very challenging in a school to deliver. Um, any, anyone have, uh, have something to share along those lines? I can share. Um, I noted um, just the lighting sometimes can be a, a challenge. Um, I know some classrooms you might be able to put some lamps in, give the kids some sunglasses, but um, that might be a difficult one to adjust, especially if like in the gym and that type of area, that type of lighting might be a challenge. Absolutely. But those are, those are good um, accommodation suggestions if sunglasses could work or, or if lamps in certain in certain classrooms could work. That's great. Other other thoughts about lighting? Other ideas? I found that um, trying to get more um, closed in spots for kids in the PE and music. So using like refrigerator boxes or big dryer boxes and creating a cocoon so they can still listen and hear, but they feel safer. And um, so almost like a calming station within those larger unstructured environments so they're still accessing their education it's a challenge and I, I'm hoping that maybe ODE can bring that to life in terms of 
things that we really need to see happening because it's not just kids with this level of trauma, but it's happening across the board. Um, so. Absolutely, thank you for that. Yeah, I can, um, I'll share that with our PE health um, specialist uh, to start with. Thank you. Other thoughts on on this the symptoms or or potential accommodations. We have a little bit more. I'm, I'm looking at you know just you know uh, with a student who's who may be experiencing any of these um, just the mental health potential mental health impact. Um, you know, and this is this is I think common with with students who experience disability is the potential of embarrassment or um, frustration with ability like a, a change in ability or those kind of things. But um, self esteem takes a beating. Yeah. The other thing that comes to mind this is definitely um, can impact our students, but it's going to impact our staff too. And accommodations they might need to so I don't know maybe you'll have that later but everyone in the school setting is going to could be impacted and as I read through those solutions again they are things that could be universal changes in a classroom um, because lighting can be um, harsh for a lot more people than just those who are diagnosed calming uh, strategies can be helpful for all of our students and us. Absolutely. Thank you all for sharing and participating in our activity. I'm going to go ahead and reshare um, my screen and move into neuro recovery. Um, so here we're in this section, we're really talking about the mental health and neurocognitive impacts of long COVID. Um, on children. And um, OHSU, um, OHSU's Dr. Hall shared this information with us and um, really acknowledged the growing epidemic within the pandemic, uh, and that is the childhood mental health crisis. Um, that there's been a notable increase in onset of psychological symptoms in youth during this pandemic. Um, we see upticks in anxiety, depression, irritability, boredom, and inattention, um, which could be related to the environment, but um, particularly with children with long COVID, it's all of those things on top of the direct effects of the infection itself um, that can lead to changes in cognition for those, um, for those kiddos. And the most common mental health concern that doctors see with adults with long COVID is anxiety or increased stress and worry. Um, and this, there's emerging literature that's also showing a similar pattern in children, um, particularly the anxiousness piece. Um, this is becoming more prevalent with kids with social anxiety. Um, so there might be a kiddo with hesitation to go to school, and it will likely be amplified um, even more with a child with long COVID. Also, adolescents and young adults with disabilities have had differential impacts uh, related to anxiety during, the, during this pandemic, um, especially those that identify in minoritized racial groups. Um, so something to consider. Changes in mood, depression, and anxiousness are all interrelated and often go together. Um, so this is very well documented in adults with long COVID. Depression in children often displays a little differently as changes in mood, which may, unchar may be uncharacteristic for, um, for youth. So increasing irritability, even for a child that's already irritable, increasing irritability, I have a teen. Um, and uh, a, a kiddo who's really not wanting to return to an activity that they once enjoyed. Um, so again, uh, hard to sleuth out what really is causing this, but um, 
neurocognition could be causing uh, this behavior. Other elements of concern, of course, is suicidality um, for our adolescents ages 12 to 17. We, see, we saw in the US emergency room visits for suicide ideation um, that attempts started to increase in early 2020, uh, the onset of our, of our pandemic, but those levels, those increased levels have sustained over time, especially for adolescent females, um, which is a particular concern. I would like to make a comment, Leanne. I know when we think about mental health in our schools, many people, the first thing they think of is our school psychs, but uh, just uh, our OTs, our therapists are, it is within their scope of practice as well to really uh, address um, mental health. So this group is uh, really in tune to uh, some of these factors. So welcome any comments about that um, for those of you who work in this area. Yes, thank you, Deborah. And that, and that just, and, and to piggyback on that, that conversation as far as um, it's not thinking out of the box necessarily because those who are in the box already know that that you are um, key uh, participants in, you know, for example, a school mental health team or or certainly working with a student who's struggling with mental health issues, but we're sharing that information um, to to administrators and others who are looking at how, how to best uh, respond to mental, this mental health crisis at Leanne, just, you know, um, school nurses as well um, that are medical, medically licensed providers have training and expertise in this area uh, that should be included. Absolutely agree with you, Deborah. Thank you. Dr. All also shared uh, this slide on brain fog um, and uh, shared that brain fog really is a commonplace term used to describe cognition in a lot of different medical conditions um, where brain fog is really described as feeling confused and focused, disorganized and forgetful. Um, and he described it as related to the inflammatory aftermath of COVID-19, uh, where brain, the brain's inner pathways, you know, are so intricately connected um, that that inflammation really clogs those pathways and is believed to cause this fog. Um, and he used an analogy of a, of a windstorm where it's similar to debris in a roadway after a windstorm, um, where it just takes a long time for that debris to clear out um, in order for our brain to function as effectively as it once did. Eli, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Um, I keep going back to concussion here um, and some of the same accommodations that we may provide to a student who's been diagnosed with a concussion or brain injury, um, but should consider academic accommodations. So some, uh, you know, a student who's reporting or, or exhibiting these symptoms should be, re, you know, assessed and reviewed um, as it relates to their ability to access uh, learning uh, in the school setting. Um, you know, and, and, may, and this may require a formal evaluation um, by OT, you know, PT uh, personnel or, you know, and or others, uh, including, you know, the school psych or somebody else who's, who's, um, who's designated as someone who can evaluate. Next slide. I think these are all strategies that we've already talked about for the most part, you, um, reducing workload, exams in separate setting, minimize distraction. Um, social support and engagement was one that was highlighted. Um, you know, oftentimes we, we kind of zero in um, and that may, may be uh, isolating for the student when uh, they really need um, the support from their peers or social engagements. So helping, helping navigate that, um, that anxiety piece plays, uh, can play in a, a big piece of this uh, and is commingled with potential um, uh, challenges as it relates to cognitive uh, ability. Uh, memory strategies, uh, assistive technology may, may help uh, in, in being able to, uh, to learn um, and so forth. Mindfulness strategies. I, I, I really appreciate the conversation that was happening in the chat related to 
um, trying to implement things that uh, um, that are, make the environment more conducive to a student who well to all students, um, but certainly to the students who are who are experiencing one of these symptoms. Um, and the challenge of accepting those those modifications to the classroom um, that that may really impact. And so um, I think that's a challenge that that schools are the the machine is 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 slower than than what the people on the ground are are seeing that are needed. Um, and so hopefully uh, schools are, will continue to to be flexible or learn to be flexible as we move forward. Next slide. Um, yeah, I agree, Deborah. In the chat, you said this is a symptom I hear most about, um, and that's the same uh, the same that experience that I've I've heard and have experienced, um, uh, and is is maybe more also the most elusive um, to 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 folks as far as understanding, recognizing, and implementing uh, accommodations. Well, when we walk around in a fog, all of the things are more difficult: executive functioning, planning ahead. Uh, your memory, if you're not able to focus like you were before, all of those things are impacted. Eli, I see in the chat a comment from um, Mike saying, I'm hoping to hear some examples of what specifically designed instruction might look like for a student with long COVID and some IEP goals that could potentially be um, do you remember from our previous from our previous presentations if we've we haven't gone into depth as far as how teams may implement specific specially designed instruction for students I would maybe punt that back to the group who are in those IEP team meetings more um, what the U.S. Department of Ed has said is that there may be situations where um, and also maybe look at my colleague Linda um, not to put you on the spot but um, that there may be situations where a student may become eligible for IDEA uh, as a result or as a di um, as as uh, as relation to long COVID, um, so they didn't rule it out, but they also didn't um, you know suggest it. You know, like it's it's going to be something that's evaluated on, on the student by student basis based on their needs and the results of their evaluations. Um, yeah, I think they might qualify under other health impaired, especially if there's documentation that's expected to last more than, you know, 60 days or so. Yeah. So they may be somebody, and from your slides, it could be somebody who already had a disability, of course, or it could be that this is, is, is becoming the disabling um, factor. Mm -hmm. And, and if they're, you know, and if they're already eligible under a, a different disability, then, you know, services, PTOT services may be, may be needed to be adjusted or added, um, you know, certainly as a related service so they can, can access their education and, and the SDI. And of course, um, the and IEP goal should always be the student's IEP goal and then the services that are needed to help support that. So yes, an IEP absolutely. goal would, would be that they need to access curriculum in some way and then what services are needed to support that, not necessarily. So is it a new goal? Well, it starts with the student's goals. A note in the chat about specially designed instruction, where I see this might happening is for the typical student, maybe they would need a lesson on a topic maybe two or three times, but this child might need that lesson, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe a hundred times. So that specially designed instruction would just be that increased ability to have that instruction for those specific goals. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Eli, I was thinking that so so we normally go back to our worksheet um, and add in kind of the those neuro um, accommodations or thinking about the neuro symptoms. Um, but I know that we just have a few minutes and I want to make sure that we do have time for questions. So Eli, I was thinking that we would go move on to the case studies. Yeah. So I think yes, we've got about 12 minutes left and let's talk about the person. Okay, um, so the first case study, uh, these are a couple of studies that case studies that were 
provided to us by the team uh, from OHSU. Uh, we've modified them just slightly, um, just to uh, make them a little bit more uh, school-based. But um, the first student, AB, uh, is a 15-year-old boy who presents to the clinic with uh, the chief complaint of fatigue. He was previously healthy, played two sports, baseball, football, enjoyed choir, trumpet practice, and was a straight A student, a busy kid. Um, he had COVID five months ago. It was mild um, in reported that he was the least sick in his family. It seemed to get better, but then was more tired. Uh, he wants to participate in soccer, tries to do practice, but feels like he ran a marathon afterward. afterwards, uh, has gym class three times a week, feels tired after choir and band practice. Because he feels so bad after activity, he is scared about doing anything at all. Uh, he experiences his heart racing, uh, sometimes feels like he'll pass out, daily headaches, challenges with mental health uh, because of feeling ill so long for so long. Um, parents say that he's uh, after practice, he spends the next day in bed. He can't come down to eat dinner. Uh, they often bring him food. He is tired appearing, uh, but his overall exam is normal, lab work normal. Neurocognitive testing shows just a new bit of mild inattention signal. Um, so, if AB walks into your into your school, um, you know what are some of the things that that the school community or, or team uh, should do, can do? Uh, what 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 would what's your thinking thoughts on this? potential need for educational need and or maybe process within the school setting? I think one of the first things is as a school team acknowledging that the students experiencing this and not just like, well, you'll get over it, just really acknowledging that this is something the kids really struggling with. Yeah. You, know, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, I find that when I get asked to come in, especially middle school and high school, I might do a kind of a focused interview, starting with just asking those open-ended questions and diving in and getting the participant to start to tell me more about what they're experiencing at school so that I'm not assuming what recommendations are necessary, but really getting them on board. And then I pre present that to the team as a collaborative, I, this is part of my evaluation as I did X, Y, Z. I just think that school teams are so stretched that we don't really take the time to interview the, the student. We do all the testing, but we're not really taking the heart of the student who has, he knows himself the best. So I think looking at these symptoms might guide me to have that in the background, but to really start with what, you know, what is it you like? What is it that you find struggling at school? How is the hallways? How's the noise? You know, like what's the lighting like? And get them to start thinking about it as it relates to school. And then together coming up with some options that he feels comfortable with and then presenting that to the team rather than the team doing it for him, because then we have the resistance. Elementary is a little different, but I found middle school and high school um, teams that have allowed me to do that are actually, um, we're pretty impressed. And I'm like, where's the counselor in all this? You know, like they're on campus every day. Can't they be interviewed? But there's a lot of disconnect when it comes to that. So that's my thoughts. You know, when I look at this slide, I don't see anything that says he was actually, somebody actually said you have long COVID. It just, it seems like that's where it should be. So even going back to the diagnosis and our, um, it, is this what's going to typically be presented? And then the staff has to, it, I mean, what kind of testing? And I mean, it just makes me curious. Leslie, um, you had your hand up, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just was thinking about Kelly Mailer's interoceptive awareness programs and thinking about maybe that would be really relevant for these kids to be able to identify what their issues are, come up with some strategies or, you know, because that may be a new mindset or a reality for them that they they may need to kind of tap back into how am I feeling and, you know, how is this impacting me? And that might be something that could be a little bit more of a broad spread 
um, teaching for our counselors and maybe, because I don't see, I probably won't see many of these kids that have typical um, gen, you know, gen ed kids who might come back with this, but there might be some that are really appropriate for us to serve. And this student being a straight A student and being involved in so many things has fallen pretty far uh, so far. So how do you help them to get back out of that, um, out of that funk, goes beyond funk? It was, it's interesting. Um, I think it's, it's you, Leslie, that, that mentioned just that, that, that you may not have access or be because of the, the you know, the student being so, um, you know, gen ed and, um, uh, and that was brought up in one of our presentations uh, at COSA with with some of the school SPED directors. Um, in that, this this kind of the challenge with this is it may present it presents equally, or it certainly presents in the gen ed population where all the supports in the school setting is more is often in the special ed, or and so they were thinking about how to how to maybe increase access or what policy like processes could be in place to help bridge that gap um, because these students are, are, are maybe in a different area, even though even though the goal is to integrate and to have access, um, you know, your time is busy uh, providing services to those students who are identified already, oftentimes. Um, what about uh, 504 evaluation? Is this something that would trigger maybe looking at a 504 or I would think maybe that would be the case because what about like, you know, a student who has rheumatoid arthritis, who has flare ups, but might be a gen ed kid. And, you know, once in a while they're going to have some challenges because this might come in waves. It might not just be a one steady progression to a point of improvement or, you know, I think as more stresses and fatigues and other things happen to students, they may have like a TBI more ongoing involved symptoms throughout their lifetime. And we're just not really there yet. But I feel like the mental health as a whole is sometimes, you know, one of those things we're not really always super great at, like, uh, keeping track of for students at schools. Right. Or supporting. So. And, and, and I think, I mean, it's important to remember also that, you know, 504, though, diagnosis it can be helpful, doesn't, doesn't require a diagnosis. You know, it's, it's based, it can be based on the disability that's being presented um, and the need for that student to have accommodations. So, um, you know, it's it is potentially a tool uh, and ensures that access to those services. Yeah, the, yeah. I thought maybe we would just open it up for general questions for these last few minutes, and I'm sure that Deborah has some final final thoughts. So I <laughs> see uh, that Monica. Uh, I always have final thoughts. I don't always have it. <laughs> you don't always have the soapbox to give them. But Monica Clark, I see you have your hand up. Share with Yeah, me. I just have a question for Eli and Leanne about what did you get a sense from the medical team how often they're willing to give this diagnosis of long COVID to kids, how, how much they're seeing it and how often they're giving that kind of diagnosis. I'm just wondering, because it seems like it's difficult in the adult population for adults to get that diagnosis of long COVID. Did they say anything about that? I'm just curious. It would seem even harder in children to me, but I don't know. Did you guys hear anything about that? Just curious. I, I did get the sense that um, by the time a a child and family had made their way to the OHSU um, pediatric long COVID clinic, that the diagnosis was um, was confirmed um, at that point that that the the children that they were seeing um, had significant impact on their lives. Um, but they they spoke at length um, that they are of course very busy, but but that they know that there's all kinds of children that are having impacts that either can't make it can't make their way up to see them or are being missed um i just don't don't have uh the support the you know equal access to health care um that we have so 
so it was my sense that the that the probably I'm sure it's not every single case, but um, the majority of those that they see at the OHSU clinic were receiving the diagnosis. Um, but they also just recognize that they they see nowhere near um, the the children that are being impacted by it. Eli, did you hear anything different? No, I got that same sense. Um, and because I mean, and because we're living it and um, and be studying it at the same time, the the you know, Leanne mentioned that less than ten percent of um, you know, but there are some studies that showed a much higher level of of long COVID in, in pediatric populations, and so they're still trying to zone in on on what that what they think is actually you know you know the number of of pediatric patients that are impacted. So. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're building the airplane while we're flying it or trying to keep the airplane up. While it's being built. <laughs> yeah, that's what it seems like. That's good. Thank you. It's good information. And, you know, so often we who work with our learners who have documented disabilities, we know that if you make something better for a person with a disability, that it makes it better for everybody. It's really hard to step back and look at that um, uh, when things are so busy and crazy, but uh, it, it is about giving kids choices, making sure, first of all, that we consider who's going to be coming to our classroom. And if we know that somebody has difficulty um, with memory, or give them another option, another way to express their knowledge or um, just building those things in. Uh, up front, and then kids aren't singled out. If the technology is available to everybody, well, when is it assistive? It's assistive when that learner uh, doesn't have a plan B. So even if something is being used by everybody, it really needs to be documented that this student needs this because assistive technology is going to be a key for a lot of our kids. Um, and making sure that everything that we give them is accessible from the beginning. Uh, Linda Brown and I are always on our accessible educational materials soapbox. Um, and but just making sure that we're considering who's coming to our who's coming to our classroom and helping them and involving them, because we're all about student voice, student choice, and uh, ha having our students help help us to know. Um, what choices should be in the classroom. So I don't know if all of that made sense, but uh, there are some things we can do one off. But when we look at each of our disabilities, there are categories, low incidence or otherwise, um, we, we can see similarities that universal design, a multi-tiered uh, system of support can be um, can provide some of those solutions. These are some of the mindsets that are starting to change. And uh, as Eli um, would point out, you know, the funding for working individually with kids comes from a specific spot. So providing supports for all kids um, is, is a shift. Um, but, but these are some of the ways that we're helping folks or helps that folks are learning to work with and support beyond their caseload. So it really comes back to uh, providing universal supports for kids. So these are topics, these are things that are coming into conversation and it seems like they all come back around to, you are the folks providing access for these kids. You are on the front line with that. When we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion, none of that can happen without access whether it's access, uh, well, for any reason, but particularly for our kids who are uh, in this unknown area um, that we're just now finding out and still finding out it's evolving. So some difficult conversations, difficult things to think about, but thank you all for being here in our community of practice to talk about and share these things. I know Eli and Leanne will be happy to answer questions uh, beyond today. Uh, we have a great partnership with these folks, and we are so thankful uh, that you are here uh, to share with us. So please share your comments, your feedback, and let us know how we can support you. You can turn off the recording, Chandra. <laughs>